Good evening, everyone, and welcome to 31 Bly Street, the beautiful headquarters of the Lowy Institute. My name is Andrew Griffiths, and I'm the head of media and communications here at the Institute. I'd like to start tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We're delighted to welcome so many journalists from across the Pacific Islands here tonight, uh, along with our Australian media colleagues. Of course, Australian journalists have a long and storied tradition of reporting on and from the Pacific Islands. But I think we'd all agree that historically, most reporting on the region has been a bit one way, Western voices telling Pacific stories. And while it's encouraging to see, hear, and read more Pacific perspectives in our media in recent years, the need to further elevate Pacific voices on issues affecting Pacific Islands, uh, Pacific Island countries has never been more important. The great stories of our age are being played out on our and your doorsteps. A great strategic rivalry between the United States and China, the challenge of a global response to climate change, the need for free and impartial media, the future of alliances, diplomacy and democracy. There is an increasing appetite for your views and experiences on these issues. Unfortunately, we can't cover all of them here tonight. There is just too little time. This evening, our focus will be geopolitics and the Pacific media. Our panel will examine the intensifying rivalries in the region and the influence on Pacific reporting. What are the challenges Pacific Islands reporters face covering geopolitics and how do they manage the pressures of external influence and safeguard press freedom? Our panel tonight includes Dr. Meg Keane, the director of the Lowy Institute's Pacific Islands program. She's joined on stage by three Pacific news leaders, Rosie Dovavarata, Neville Choi, and Viola Ulukai. At the conclusion of their discussion, we'll open to the floor for questions in a room full of journalists. I can't imagine anybody will want to ask a question. We hope tonight will be a chance for you to connect with your Australian colleagues and other journalists from across the region, although I know many of you have been doing that throughout the days. Um, so we hope you'll stay for some drinks and some nibbles as well. Finally, I also want to invite you to come and chat with myself and my Lowy Institute colleagues to talk about ways in which our research and our resources might be useful to your own work. So now it's time to kick off our panel discussion. So please join me in giving our panelists a very warm welcome. So before we begin, is everybody, I don't have my glasses on, but is everybody who's at the back happy to be at the back and standing and don't want to come up front, which is great. Um, certainly welcome to everybody. Um, Bula, uh, Tali Tali Fia Fia, uh, welcome in every other language you can think of, bienvenue. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you're all here. And as Andrew said, it's amazing to have so many media in one room. I think it exceeds what I've seen at um, Pacific summits, et cetera. So what's going to be interesting is how does media report on media? And um, I'm going to be interested to see that tomorrow. Uh, like Andrew, I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, their culture, their values, uh, and the land on which we meet. But really importantly, our indigenous people here in Australia have worked very hard to have a voice uh, not always successfully, to influence policy and politics. And that's very relevant to what we're talking about today, is how the Pacific media takes this very com complicated geopolitical situations and puts their lens on it and conveys that to the world. We certainly know that there has been a, a rising geopolitical pressures, uh, a lot of visits to the region. And while we often hear about how that manifests itself, we don't always see how it impacts on the Pacific media. And that's really what we want to look at. We know that there's been changes in ownerships of media outlets, there's been financial contributions, there's been exchanges to major power countries uh, for training and hobnobbing and possibly a bit of influence. 
And we certainly know there's been an uptick in the way diplomatic missions are creating news to get into the papers. So all of this goes to how we manage this geopolitics and the influence that it tries to bring and keep that Pacific lens. And I have a fantastic panel. Uh, you got their names, but you didn't get just their depth of experience. So I thought I'd just quickly say that uh, beside me here, uh, Rosie has been the acting publisher and CEO of the Fiji Sun. She is also the co-founder, I believe, of uh, Women in Media for Fiji, but then has gone on to expand that to all the Pacific as well. So that we've got some interesting issues about gender that we can uh, explore. Uh, Neville Choi has been, well, is the president of the PNG Media Council, but has also been an editor in chief uh, for a major paper in PNG, and is certainly no stranger to taking a strong stance about media independence <laughs> in his own country. And then uh, Viola Ulakai, who has, I think, over 30 years of experience in the media. I've just learned that she's also been an international correspondent, uh, as well as the general manager of the Tonga Broadcasting Corporation, and a, and a really important player in, in, in PINA, uh, which I think you're all familiar with, the Pacific Island News Association. So we've got an enormous almost intimidating uh, amount of expertise up here. I did say that I'm going to throw some questions, but given that these people all have more experience than me, I said feel free to ask each other questions too, and we'll just roll on. Uh, so great. I wanted to start uh, with, with Neville, and I wanted to think about influence in the media, uh, and particularly in PNG, where we've seen absolute flood of external players and leaders coming in from everywhere, from France, Indonesia, China, Australia, uh, many different countries. They bring their own media packs with them. Uh, and then we have these issues that go to geopolitics about uh, security agreements and about recognition and about free trade agreements. And then you get media packs coming into your country looking at when there's major events, massacres, riots, motions of no confidence. So I'm interested to know how this attention and the reporting actually do you get to reflect cultural context, PNG perspectives. And does all this presence start to change the way Papua New Guineans see these geopolitical issues and expect media to report on them? So what's been your experience of this influx? Uh, thank you, Meg. Um, I think for the media in Papua New Guinea, um, regardless of the scale of the, of the foreign dignitaries who, who attend uh, who visit, um, they may have their own motivations. Much of that is um, from a national perspective, from a regional perspective. Uh, but I think the media organizations are very aware of the challenges that the people in PNG face. And they are the audiences of our, of our, of our output and our productions. Um, so I think the work that the PNG media does in contextualizing what these visits mean, I mean, when they come with their own media packs, as you put it, um, they do report on the national, regional, and global aspects of it. Uh, but I think um, the PNG media has been very successful in contextualizing the challenges and what it means to the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, having these foreign um, powers coming in, um, having them talk about um, major issues like climate change. But breaking it down is what the PNG media does. And I think that has come through very strongly. And do you find that your media people are being asked more and more to have an input into the international reporting? Or is that still something you're breaking into and needs to change? Well, case in point would be the recent riots of January 10th. Um, so January 10th, 11th, and the 12th was when much of it was happening. And then, but immediately after that, after control was restored and order was restored, um, the city basically went back to semi-normal. But it was then that the international media started getting footage of the riots and stories about the riots. So we saw a, a rise in the international stories um, sh um, depicting Papua New Guinea as being in chaos, 
when everything had already been settling down. Mm. I think that points to either the international media um, not having access and not being on the ground to report truthfully. Mm. Yeah. Rose, I was just wondering your reflections on this. And if we look at Fiji, it's a hub. It probably has more diplomatic representation in Suva than any other Pacific Island country. It also is host to regional agencies. Like many other countries, it has a policy of friends to all. And I wonder if that starts to push in on media of offense to few, please, and a pressure to offend few in their foreign engagements in your country or not. How are you experiencing this foreign engagement in Fiji? Yeah, I think similar to what Neville has said, um, you know, we are very aware of the needs of, uh, of our people. Um, you know, just because the Secretary of State lands in Fiji doesn't mean that, you know, that they will be given prime time or, you know, on the front pages. Um, so, so I think um, newsroom leaders are well aware of, um, mm -hmm. of what's going on. And again, providing context. Um, I think that's important that, you know, gives perspective mm -hmm. to what really, you know, are the bread and butter issues that our, that our people face every day. <laughs> You know, in a, an earlier conversation, we were talking about not only is there this foreign influence or the potential for foreign influence, there is a need for a strong stance by Pacific organizations to take safeguards to protect media independence uh, in their countries with foreign interests coming in and possibly foreign investment in media. Could you talk a little bit about what those safeguards might look like in your opinion? Um, thank you, Doctor. Firstly, I would like to um, pose the question of uh, whether the Pacific media has a choice when geopro uh, geopolitical competition influences us um, through making donations to what media needs in terms of, uh, let's say, financially, um, technology, capacity building, and other needs um, such as uh, sponsored um, study trips to their country, mm -hmm. uh, their countries. Um, are we, the media in the Pacific, uh, vulnerable to such um, geopo uh, geopolitical uh, competition? Um, you know, we are a small scale economy and uh, most national governments um, heavily depend on foreign aid and loans. And the media, even um, national or government-owned media, you know, for instance, um, like Tonga Broadcasting Commission, uh, us, we do not get a portion of the national budget. And um, I've noted that um, Tonga Broadcasting Commission is one. Um, in this case, I believe that uh, we cannot uh, distance ourselves from uh, geopolitical influences as they come in and assist um, in much needed areas. Um, in this way, I believe we can embrace geopolitical assistance as long as we do not comprise, uh, compromise our content. That is, we cannot be uh, vulnerable to major powers of, let's say, the United States, China, even New Zealand and Australia, uh, to manipulate our independence and distort our uh, editorial independence. So I'm sure um, that in that case, we can all um, attest to this reality and common experience that we share and experience as small scale economies, not only in our national economies, but also in the media landscape that we um, operate in. Mm -hmm. So Viola, you've raised this issue of finances. And yes. uh, we had just this morning the news in New Zealand that its news hub has, is going to be closed, possibly 300 jobs lost. 
but also a feed of information that, that goes into the Pacific. But there is always this problem with small media outlets about financial viability and where you get your resources from and whether or not that makes you um, vulnerable in the geopolitical sense. But I wanted to start, Neville, in, in, as I understand it, in P&G, the Post Courier is one of the only uh, newspapers in the Pacific that is financially independent. It, it actually turns a profit. And so what interests me about that is then, do you see investment in mentoring, in training? Uh, we would expect maybe to see some more investigative journalism, possibly a, a foreign, but also with domestic issues. But I'm not sure we're seeing that uptick in investigative journalism. So it has the finances, what's the implication? And if something's holding back doing the investigative journalism, what is it? Is it the finances or is it something else? I think for, the, for a large part, <clears throat> it is finances. And Post Korea is, is the one that, this is the only one that's recognized that does announce profits or announce um, annual profits. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're doing better than all the other media organizations. We have a limited advertising market in, in the country. And when national unrests occur, that cuts the advertising, uh, that gives a really hard time to businesses to be able to spend on advertising. That shrinks the advertising market for, for the media. Um, so even though Post Korea may be publishing um, the annual financial results, and it looks really good, they do face the same challenge as everybody else does. With regards to investigative journalism, um, I think you may be aware of Inside PNG, which is a fairly new um, online news oh. um, 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 company. Um, and they're made up of a team of former journalists from MTV who were sacked en masse. So they got together and started Inside PNG. They don't have any, um, they don't get any funding from government, they don't get any funding from anywhere, but they do have um, international partners who have reached out and have um, collaborated with them on stories. And I think one of the major stories that they came out with recently um, was the result of eight to nine months of investigations regarding, and I think um, the AFP recently made an arrest in Brisbane with regards to that story. And I know for a fact that the AFP did um, at some point work with Inside PNG and OCCRP, who was helping them with investigative journalism. So that one story has changed the entire landscape of transparency, um, accountability. And you'll note that the, for, the effect of that one story even has politicians um, coming out and, and presenting and um, naming people and presenting statistics where previously that wasn't really available. Yeah, Meg, I'd yeah. just like to add, I mean, the case is similar in Fiji. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we are after the same advertising dollar. Um, the market is small. Um, so in our case, for instance, for the Fiji Sun, you know, I apply for every opportunity that's out there. Um, and, and I think what, um, you know, whether it's from Google News Initiative, whether it's through PACMES, you know, it, it, you know we, are, we are there, we are applying for these things. Um, and I think, um, you know, as Neville had said in regards to your question about investigative journalism, so what we did uh, back in 2019 was when we were, were awarded um, a Google News Initiative emergency fund. So that's when we decided, okay, you know, we'll start up. Um, an investigative team, which makes up one person, and, and we've... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, New definition of a team, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've maintained that um, up till today. Um, it's a challenge, and again, you know, it comes down to resources, and, and it's something that I've heard, you know, throughout the past few days that we've been together, the shared challenges of, um, you know, of trying to maintain people. You know, they come in, two, three years, and they're out the door. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, the institutional knowledge that some of those in this room have uh, are not what we see, uh, you know, in the paper or on, on our news shows. So these are some of the issues that we continue mm -hmm. to grapple with. And uh, it will take time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if the funding is not there, you know, we will continue to be challenged. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what works? I mean, what's coming, and I, and I know all of you in one way or another have been with um, building up networks. So it's not only about the finances, it's about the capacity. Uh, with geopolitical issues, they transcend borders. So it doesn't matter whether you're doing trade, crime, 
climate change. So that collaborative approach, and you've got a lot of collaborators sitting in the audience in front of you, is obviously pretty key. And I wonder if you can reflect on what's been really effective in building teams that go beyond one. Is it associations like PINA, or is it less formal associations, collaborations? What is it that gives you that edge that allows you to deliver on those more complex stories? Um, I think PINA um, has committed, uh, you know, for several years in terms of uh, capacity building of media personnel in all uh, Pacific Island countries, Tonga included. And um, from my experience, um, thanks to the uh, organizations such as um, BIPA, now phased out, um, and now we have the Pacific Media Initiative of APC. And uh, BINA can no longer uh, do this alone to be effective and uh, sustainable as in the 1980s and 2000s, I think, and also caters for the human uh, capacity and technical um, needs of regional media organizations. So I am grateful uh, to say that uh, Tonga Broadcasting Commission and Tonga and the media organizations back at home um, have benefited from uh, regional networking through BINA. News uh, reporters, technicians, and producers uh, from Tonga have the past uh, received um, uh, capacity development opportunities. Um, and that was uh, through uh, these networks. So I wonder, Rosie, I know you've been very involved with um, digital transformation of, of media and, and using digital formats to expand networks, access news, transmit news. Uh, is this one way where you can uh, expand on your information sources, so you can connect with other colleagues, you can add depth to stories? So I'm interested with this digital transformation. Is it about that you can get your stories out and it influences how, they're, how geopolitics is looked at? Or is it that people are putting information into your system, and how does it work to deal with geopolitical issues? I think the collaboration is important, that it's uh, both ways. Um, and I think it's, it's worked for us. Um, just an example, we, we had some uh, funding for the, uh, with the EJN, uh, where we worked on, um, on zoonotic diseases, um, you know, that were happening in Fiji, uh, leptospirosis. Um, I mean, that's just one example. Mm. So, our, you know, our reporter was working closely with those, uh, and it wasn't just us, it was about seven other um, newsrooms in Asia. So I think, you know, those are really useful, that it's not just, um, you know, the voices of those from the outside coming in, but also, you know, we, we are the Pacific. We understand our culture and our traditions, and I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, and, um, and, and they're very important, those collaborations where our input is, uh, you know, it's, it's a vital part of that. Mm -hmm. And do you get insights on what's happening geopolitically in other countries, whether it's China's investment and in aid programs, the way the U.S. is engaging, politicization of uh, geopolitical issues, or uh, do, do you get, does it allow you to, to interact and compare what's going on in your country compared to other countries? Uh, back in Tonga, you know, um, of course they have all these uh, development programs and um, most of the time I can tell that, uh, you know, um, they want uh, more publicity. So I can, you know, seeing we really need the money, I asked the program uh, department, asked them if they want to broadcast it live on, on radio Tonga or television Tonga, they have to pay for it. But, you know, apart from the news team, they can cover it up to them what angle they want to take. But if they, you know, because sometimes you can tell that they want, you know, most of the program to be part of, uh, let's say, the news or 
uh, some of the programs on um, either radio or TV. So what actually happened at home, we asked them, if you want the whole program to be on TV or radio, you pay for the airtime. As for the news, it's up to the news team to see whatever you know, they want to take for their news. Does anybody want to add to that about you know, that whole connecting with others in the region to get a perspective on what is the geopolitical engagements and how they're being handled and, and how it reflects on what's going on in your own countries? Um, well, for Papua New Guinea, I think the, the acknowledgement of where these geopolitical um, arrangements come in um, is pretty clear. There are clear lines as to what's, um, what's nationally or globally motivated as compared to what's motivated nationally and on the ground. Um, it comes back to what we've been talking about is contextualizing. Um, but the issue is, I think, the safe, take the United States Embassy, for example. The United States understands that the freedom of media is important. So we'll never find the, the US Embassy trying to impose anything on any newsroom unless it's a public event. Um, if there is something else that, that they would like to have aired or broadcast or printed or published, then they would have to pay for it as an advertorial. I think that the lines between the newsroom, news and editorial management and the management of the company has to be clear. Um, because we do understand that there are pressures um, within the country that come down from collaborations between different governments and different countries. And whether it's directly from or through our government or our national leadership, or whether it's through um, corporate interests. So there, there may be companies that are operating in Papua New Guinea who are either state-owned by other foreign, foreign governments or who actually um, um, may report to them in, in some sort of way. So we are fully aware of that. And I think the, the lines between what's editorially considered as news as opposed to what's um, considered public information are clear. Yeah. And Megan, if I can just add, um, you know, we just had a session before coming here uh, regarding this topic and uh, something my colleague from the Solomon Islands talked about, uh, Georgina, you know, when we are asked uh, about the influence, how has this influenced uh, the way that you report? You know, and she replied to, to say that, you know, I'm, I'm the one who's doing the influencing, not, not uh, you know, the superpowers or those who are trying to come in. So I think it goes back again to uh, newsroom leadership, uh, as we talked about earlier today. And that's very important that, um, you know, the newsroom leadership are well aware of where they stand when they're covering um, these geopolitical issues that we face. And this attempt to shape yep. the way the news mm -hmm. narrative goes. I think we'll um, move now to some questions from the audience just to pull out some of these issues on geopolitics uh, and the media and, and how the media is trying to shape the news narrative. Uh, if you have a question, please just state who you are. Uh, and then if you want a particular person to uh, answer initially, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll all have a go. So is there questions from the audience? Oliver? Uh, hi, I'm Oliver Lovedal. I'm the FTC Technical Director. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Megan, our panelists, for the very insightful discussions. I'm Oliver Lovedal. I'm the FDC Fellow with the Lowy Institute, currently on secondment from the PNG government. Um, sticking a little bit closer to home, and I'm going to ask Neville a question. Uh, so um, you talked about the recent riots uh, that occurred in, in Port Moresby, and that was a field day for um, media, both international and domestic. And you would also be aware that uh, the government had tried to shut down the mediums of uh, disseminating information uh, by shutting down social media because they were concerned that there was misinformation being reported um, by the media, having the freedom that they have. So sort of around the issue of um, having media independence, uh, and coming up with that comes a lot of uh, responsibility and uh, the responsibility to uphold its integrity. So with PNG Media Council establishing the Press uh, Complaints Committee, do you think that this is an institution that will help to garner more support from both the public and the government uh, and to avoid some more um, government inter intervention? Uh, thanks, Oliver. Um, I think it's best to give a bit of background about that. I mean, so the riots have happened, but all of this and, and the minister's announcements 
of his concerns about how social media was being used by members of the public. Um, it all comes under the, under the move to come up with a policy for the media in PNG. Um, those discussions are still continuing. Um, I think we're up to version four of this draft policy. Um, and he, he rightly said and that it, it, wasn't a it wasn't an attempt to shut down social media. What he did was he stood on the only um, law he had to make a comment and make a public statement about the use of social media during um, situations of national unrest or threats to national security. The January 10th riots was one of those, it was one of those times. And the only law that he had to stand on was the, the NICTA law, which is the national, um, it's the national regulator for broadcasting in the country. Um, so I think he immediately backtracked after it blew up on social media that he was shutting down social media or threatening to shut down social media. His perspective was that he was trying to make sure that Papua New Guineans were more, were more mature about the way they use social media. Um, and I think one of the reasons why things escalated so quickly was that we had a lot of um, influences or people who consider themselves to be influencers being very ill-informed about what was happening and the developments after the riots, immediately after the riots. So there's a, there's a whole diaspora of different issues in that. But that's where it is. Um, with regards to the Independent Complaints Tribunal, uh, we have just um, ratified the, um, reviewed our constitution, the MCPNG constitution, and that's, that's expanded the membership of an independent complaints tribunal. It's mainly to, to show that we, the media, can regulate ourselves and can be independent in the way that we deal with, our, with complaints against the media. And is that complaints uh, possibility, you can, it can be those domestically raising complaints? Can externals raise complaints about how things are covered? Um, yes, I think it is open to anybody who's in Papua New Guinea and feels uh, wronged by anything that's been published in the media. Um, but it is specifically to have an avenue if, say, if there's a public complaint assert, um, against a certain media organization, and if, if that complaint has been filed with that media organization, but that media organization hasn't really resolved it in a way that the complainant is satisfied, then they can come to the media council and say, one of your members has wronged us, and we feel that we should be here. We should be heard about it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there another question from the audience? Can I go to this gentleman here? Oh, uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, Hamish McDonald, um, former um, foreign editor of Sydney Morning Herald. Um, I'm just wondering how you see the state of journalism training in <coughs> the Pacific. Are your universities sufficiently in, involved? Are they good enough? Are they turning out the right people? And is there, are they a location for mid-career journalists to go back and focus on new, new areas and um, important areas and so on? Uh, I ask this because um, uh, Mahalopa Lavelle, who was a fellow here at um, Lowy last year, an economist, talked to me about the way the ANU Crawford School helped revamp the University of PNG Economics Department over several years. And he was wondering if one of our institutions or several institutions could do the same with journalism schools in Pacific countries. Um, what are your thoughts? The issue about um, the quality of students um, coming out of university, especially in journalism school, that's been a, the focus in very recent times, mainly by national leadership and the public. Um, but I, and, and in, to counter that and to find out at least a, a, the start to a solution to that, we um, invited, um, the Media Council invited um, Divinewood University and the University of Papua New Guinea um, to come to us and for us to sit down in the same room and, and, and work through the issues as to what their challenges were. And they were very honest and um, they said, we are universities, we cannot be providing um, basic English and grammar um, skills to, to students that were getting from high school and secondary schools. So what they were, basic, what they were really saying was, 
we, we're just trying to do the best with what we're getting from the education system. So the problem is way, way bigger than just a, a drop in standards in, the, in journalism teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so in response to that, we've proposed at least an annual gathering of, of media in PNG, um, possibly with some regional um, integration, to have a media symposium of sorts, an annual review of journalism standards, journalism um, in innovation, and of course, a chance for the industry to showcase itself. Mm. If I may add, um, we have staff going to the University of the South Pacific for their journalism degree. Um, we could tell that, um, you know, a newly graduated um, um, person, you have to, you know, to keep on training them so what I have asked uh, the, the branch in Tonga of the University of the South Pacific, it would be better if they can have longer time for internship, you know, because when they come for internship uh, at TPC, I could tell that, uh, you know, working experience is really needed. So we have staff, uh, two will be uh, graduating this uh, semester, and two, it's the second year at the University of the South Pacific. So we are encouraging them, you know, to, to go for their further studies. Mm -hmm. And I could tell, and even the lecturers, they said, you know, I can tell the difference of uh, students who have been working for uh, their experience, and, uh, you know, students who came straight from high school. Mm. Might even need some more exchanges over this way. Are there <laughs> um, additional questions from the audience? I think, yeah, lady in the front. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Bridget Fair. I'm the CEO of Free TV Australia, and we also run the um, Pacific Oz TV service. Uh, into the region, um, but I'm interested to hear um, a bit more about the women in media side of oh. things and maybe uh, perhaps explore a little bit more about the gender issues that you're facing in your various territories, if you wouldn't mind speaking a little mm. bit about those. Thanks. Rosie, do you want to begin? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, Women in Media Fiji, we started in 2022. So it was uh, basically, um, you know, just to provide a safe space for our women content producers. So it wasn't just journalists, photographers, videographers, um, you know, anyone working in a newsroom was keen to join. Um, so, so that from the beginning, um, just a safe space where you can come in, you know, air whatever grievances. And uh, Makereta, who's there from Pina, who's also a co-founder, um, just working closely with her and ensuring that um, you know the issues raised was also elevated to the Fijian Media Association executive um, in a way where um, you know the the anonymity of uh, the issues uh, were uh, addressed. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's. Um, it's um, you know allowed them to um, to come out and, and talk about these things, which is you know a big step for a lot of them. Um, next week we'll be hosting a panel um, talking about um, um, technology facilitated gender based violence um, for International Women's Day. So so a lot of these things we've never heard before. Um, now that we are able to do together. And I think what's also important um, is the support that we have from our male um, colleagues as well. Uh, that's key. And uh, we also, you know, try to, um, you know, invite them as well uh, when we have our Talano sessions every month. And of course, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Kate Mc, uh, Kathy McLeish, who's here with us in the room, and uh, WIM Australia, who've also been very supportive too. Could you also say a little bit about, I know an area you've moved into is gendered analysis and news and, you know, the way in which when we're talking about climate change or transnational crime, that it doesn't impact everybody the same. And part of the news has to be uh, how it impacts different groups differently, including women. Is that something that's part of this media yeah. association? Yeah, so we, we just had a session before coming here on Monday um, and, and, you know, those were the, exactly the, reason, the, the issues raised by, by our members. 
um, you know, when they're out covering stories um, that also infect them. Where do they go? What do they do? Um, so, you know, we are trying to work on perhaps tip sheets, um, you know, um, getting them to um, see local um, um, agencies, uh, psychologists. Um, so, so, you know, I think the thing that we remind them, you know, as women, you tell the stories better um, of what women face in our communities. So, you know, slowly we are working through these things. And, um, and I think the, the bigger picture really is to keep them in the industry, that mm. they are safe, that they feel safe. And, you know, to keep them in the, in the industry that often, you know, when they are bullied, um, you know, cyber bullied, it's, it's their time to, to go. Yeah. yeah, we lose important reporters. Mm -hmm. I think I saw another hand up earlier. Down where? Sorry? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. I was actually just going to follow up a question about the riot with Neville. Um, can you give us a picture of the sort of coverage that was on social media versus what the mainstream media managed to do? And as um, looking at the mainstream media, what additional resources or skills or whatever would they have needed to have been able to... Um, do a job where they played a bigger role in terms of the, being the source that the population went to um, for accurate information? Well, I, I mentioned earlier about, I referred to um, social media influences. Um, I think a majority of these social media influences, because of their nature of, of who they think, who they believe they are on, on, on social media and who they speak to, I think they a majority of them weren't following the mainstream news outlets. So the news outlets were, were up to date with all the developments after the riots started. Um, they were there on, on the ground. Um, they were there when in, the investigation was announced afterwards. None of these social media influencers were aware of this, which was pretty amazing for us in the mainstream. Because if you're a social media influencer, you don't just disseminate stuff or say stuff on social media, you make sure it's vetted. Um, so we, we've been reminding these influences that, influences that um, the mainstream still does its job and it's still necessary. And it's, it's, the, it's the source of credible information. It's a source of um, information during um, unrests. Um, so I think a large part of, the, of what we were doing was probably putting out fires from people on social media who were getting... Um, posts and seeing um, seeing things not improving when they were actually were when they actually were um, resource wise um, yes I think all the media houses um, need a lot of um, capacity building um, Rosie mentioned the um, exodus of a lot of industry knowledge going out and that's based on um, either journalists um, not being recognized for their efforts etc or just moving to greener pastures. Um, I think I think the government is um, aware of the need for for official credible information, not just for the public but for the media to access. Um, we've had situations where um, either government um, secretaries, department secretaries, refuse to speak to the media, and they and um, and it's really difficult to try and get a comment. So when newsrooms decide to find the news and go after the news, they they're accused by national leadership of not following process. Um, so it's, it's a catch-22 situation, but the media does make it work. And I think partly the, the reason for the media policy and the idea of, of that is, one, PNG doesn't have a policy that governs the media or, or says anything about the media. Um, and, and two, the minister feels that this um, consolidation of state uh, government information, um, a one-stop um, avenue to get that information and to disperse that information either to the media. It doesn't stop the media from finding the information themselves, though. 
Is there any positive um, interaction between social media, which is just growing and growing, and the, the more mainstream media? Is there a benefit to having them there that you can leverage off of and that improves or, or benefits mainstream reporting? Oh, yes, there are benefits. And I think if you look at the, when the parliament sessions are live um, and, and, the, and the people on social media actually following developments in the House and actually commenting on it, and then looking and waiting for the evening bulletin to, to see how that's being interpreted by the media. So there, is a ben there, there are lots of benefits to it. It's just it may be educating and um, uh, something about media literacy that needs to be achieved. Yeah. I think there was Anne-Marie, yeah. <coughs> Hi, Anne-Marie O'Keefe, um, non-resident fellow here at the Lowy Institute. And also I reviewed the last PACMAS with um, Georgina, who's with us uh, today as well. I guess I wanted to ask a, a, a regional specific question. You've all been talking to a degree about your um, national challenges, but what do you see as the common challenges which bring you all together in terms of what you're trying to achieve with the media? We know in Australia that there are huge financial issues, there's the big challenges of disinformation, misinformation. You're facing big turnover in young staff for a whole host of reasons. But if you had to name one or two of the big challenges facing you as a region, what would the three of you say? I would say um, resources and technology. Rosie? Sustainability, trying to survive. Yeah. Never? I think, the, I think the media in the Pacific is the last frontier of true, true traditional journalism. And I think in every country, the, every country in the Pacific, the, our news managers know that. And I think they protect that very well. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I think Alex had a question that I might, I might get two and then we'll come. Alex, are you at the front here, I think? Yeah, thank you, uh, Meg. Uh, my name is Alexander Rini. Um, I've just joined PACMES uh, with ABC International Development as the team leader for the Pacific Islands. Um, just to give some context to the question that was raised um, on the state of the universities providing journalism programs um, in the Pacific Islands, uh, the onus is on the respective Pacific Island governments to actually invest in journalism programs in their own states. Um, when I was the editor of the Post Korea, I made a call to the last PNG Prime Minister, uh, Peter O'Neill, to invest in journalism at the uh, UPNG um, campus because UPNG is the oldest public you know, edu higher education institution in PNG. Um, Divine Word is the better one of the two uh, universities in terms of the output uh, quality. When I was the editor at the Sam Observer um, until um, December, I made a call out to the former prime minister, who is now long, no longer in office, to Ilaipa, to invest in journalism as well at the National University of uh, Samoa. Unfortunately, that, that hasn't been the case. And um, it's good to put out the flag, you know, talking about democratization and its impact on human rights and freedoms in your various states. But if you don't claim ownership and put the money in a, in a program that will actually empower your own people to have the freedom to express themselves through the media, then it's a lost cause. And, but I'm not going to give up, and I reckon that the PACMAS program offers this opportunity for us to work in partnership with you know, media in the Pacific Islands. And we have three champions here seated in the front um, who are also speaking the same language. So I'm actually quite positive going forward. This is just a commentary, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. We're going to go with a vision, but I wanted to get one last question just in the back corner there. Been waiting patiently. G'day. My name is Chochi Rufalo. I'm Professor and Chair of Social Work and Policy Studies at the University of Sydney and Adjunct Professor at the University of the South Pacific. What's the role of the media in privileging Pacific perspectives, the way in which we make sense of the world traditionally, culturally, in counteracting dominant Western perspectives that also helps us to reclaim our sovereignties as Pacific Island states and territories across the region? Great question. 
Who wants to lead out on that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think we, we play a big role in doing that. Um, and I think we haven't really done a lot of that um, um, lately. Um, and I think it's also finding the people who are willing to stand up and, you know, who want to tell their stories. Um, but, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area. Because you were talking a little bit earlier, Neville, about the importance of talking to your audience and context. Do you want to elaborate on that in respect to that question? Um, I, th I think the, the PNG media, I'm sorry, I'm talking about PNG again. But I think the P, within in, in PNG, I think the media is, like I said, very well aware of, of the challenges that, that the country faces. Um, and, and that's, even though it's, it's a, a particularly skewed perspective, it's, it's, what, it's what the media was meant to do, highlight challenges in the country so that there are solutions found by, by the leadership of the country, um, whether that be in a national context or a regional context. I think that is being done. Well, I remember reading something that you wrote that was about speaking <laughs> truth to power, and I wonder yeah. if this goes to that concept. I, I think we have to stick to... Um, strong ethics and honesty in our work. Mm -hmm. And how do you speak that truth to power? I'm, I'm just interested in that, you know, the powerful forces globally. Is there a way you seek to influence them and project a, a Tongan or a Pacific view or perspective? Um, in terms of uh, independence, we really have to, you know, to, to be more transparent with our um, ethics and also our daily um, assignments and work in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. I think this will go to, it's, I have a question which is sort of the flip side of Anne Marie's question is, when you look to the future, five or 10 years to the future, what is it you would like to see that might have changed with Pacific media or progressed in Pacific media? What are the one or two things that you have a vision for that you would like to see achieved in the future. Viola, do you want to begin? Um, Any thoughts? Looking ahead, um, I think Tonga and the uh, rest of the Pacific, they have to team up with Bina, APC, and also BECMES to make media better mm, in terms of uh, you know, a more independent, uh, free place, and um, uh, like, you know, the development of uh, facilities, not only, you know, back at home, but around the region. Okay. Neville, do you have thoughts on what you'd like to see? How you'd like to see Pacific media or PNG media evolving over the next five to ten years to get to a more positive space? No boundaries, no borders, um, just in pursuit of the truth collaboration. Can you elaborate on a little bit on that? What does no boundaries <laughs> and no borders mean? I mean, how, uh, what would that look like? <laughs> so say if, OK, I'll, I'll, it, to contextualize that, so with regards to the in, uh, Inside PNG story that came out, it was a very good investigative story. Now, what that did was, when, when that story came out, we had other journalists who read the, read the article and who made contact with Inside PNG saying, listen, I work for this media organization, but I like what you guys are doing. I want to be part of that, because that's the kind of reporting I want to do. Interesting, an offer, <laughs> I think, for everybody in the audience. Do you want to share your thoughts? Yeah, Rose? I think for me, it's um, you know, to see a sustainable media organization across uh, the Pacific, and uh, to be able to keep um, um, journalists um, in their role, working freely, independently, and objectively. Um, and I think more collaborations such as this, where we come together and share, um, you know, our shared challenges and opportunities, and also, you know, to make sure that it's not just another talk fest, and mm -hmm. that, you know, that we go back home and uh, we put um, whatever we learn into action. Yeah. 
So I think that's been, you know, I think a really positive end with the collaboration. But I think it's also been inspiring tonight hearing, um, I think, how positive you are about the strength of the Pacific media and the capacity to withstand foreign influence to shape those narratives. And to understand, doesn't matter whether it's finances or training overseas, et cetera, to understand what your, your job is, what you're trying to do, and how you're trying to cha shape the media to fit your own context. I think that's quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, we do see a lot more Pacific faces on the news, and I think that must reflect some capacity building that is occurring uh, across the media, because that certainly has been more typical. So I'd like to thank our panelists for, for coming out. I know some of them were on a panel just before this panel. So they've really done their panel work today, um, <laughs> which uh, it's kind of them to, to get back up and do it all again. Uh, so I appreciate that. We do have wine, cheese, and, and some nibblies uh, at the back. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for people to actually engage with people from the Pacific media, but also for the Pacific media to engage with people from Australian media, or those uh, that we've heard from who are just enthusiastic supporters uh, and have been over a number of years of strong media in the Pacific and strong shaping of the narratives uh, on geopolitics, but also on domestic politics. So thank you very much for your time.